The Lord be with you. you. Welcome to Grace on this, the fourth Sunday of Lent and the Chime Change Sunday. And you all made it to the early service. God bless you. All right, our opening hymn 431, Not All the Blood of Beasts.
We rise for divine service setting four, page 203. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking His grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins as a called and ordained servant of Christ. And by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our intro psalms printed on the readings insert, and we'll sing that responsively. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. Let us pray the collect of this day. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, your mercies are new every morning, and though we deserve only punishment, you receive us as your children and provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful goodness, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May be seated as the choir will sing, God so loved the world, which is the gospel reading for today, the, the one you see, John 3.16.
God. And we sing the gradual verses on the insert. Oh, come, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. I set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Thanks be to God. Let's rise for a reading from the Holy Gospel. The Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Jesus said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light as does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been carried out in God. This is the gospel of the Lord. And we confess together the Christian faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to invite the children forward. Well, come on up. All right. Good morning to y'all. Did you wake up kind of early today? Did you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to tell you about a conversation that Jesus had with a man named Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus was an important man back in that time. Nicodemus was one of the leaders of the Jewish people in Jerusalem. And he was... Well, he was kind of a a Bible scholar. That means he was kind of really supposed to be an expert in what the Bible taught. And he had a nickname as a teacher of Israel. So he was supposed to really be good. But you know, one night he came to talk to Jesus, and he didn't understand what Jesus was saying. I'll show you a picture. He came to Jesus to ask him some questions because he was a little, Nicodemus wasn't sure what to think about Jesus. He says, I know that no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. Well, so now look, the first picture shows Nicodemus, he's kind of wondering. See that picture right here? He's wondering, who is Jesus? How can he do such great miracles? And then he comes and Jesus talks to him. And here's Jesus explaining to Nicodemus about the kingdom of God. And and you know what? Nicodemus, even though he knew a lot of the Bible, was really struggling to understand Jesus. Yeah, but you know what? We know from later in the gospel that Nicodemus did come to understand who Jesus is. It took him some time, though. And you know what? Sometimes it takes us time to learn about God. And that's why you're here today, so that you'll learn about God. Yeah. (laughs) And you know, that's a blessing to be here while you'll learn. And how many of you go to Sunday school? Do you all go to Sunday school? Oh, yeah, that's good. Why do you go there? Because you want to learn about God, right, Zoe? Yeah, yeah. And just like, you know, nobody is too young or too old to learn. Nicodemus was an old man. But Nicodemus still had a lot to learn. And he did, thanks be to God. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, bless these children that they would learn. They would learn about their Savior Jesus. They would learn of your holy word, that they would be blessed in church and Sunday school as they grow. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And the acolyte has some candy for you.
God's grace, his peace, and his mercy be unto you. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, for God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This is our text. It's certainly, if not the best known verse in the New Testament, it's right up in the top three probably. You see John 3.16 emblazoned on all sorts of different banners, at sports events and other places, and it is good news. It's about what all the good news in the Bible is about. It's about Jesus. It's about what God has done for you. So that it should never be seen as God doing something for someone else, but for you, for all. No one is left out of God's saving work in Jesus. When he says, from the cross it is finished, that too is for you. For God so loved the world. You see how it comes out of God's love that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Well, look at the context of our Lord giving us these beautiful verses. Nicodemus coming to him to inquire there's a conversation with Nicodemus that precedes the reading. He's that Pharisee and one of the leading Pharisees who came by night to inquire of Jesus. We're not sure why he came by night, except perhaps because he doesn't really want to be seen by some of his friends. He comes by night, and listen to what happens between them. Jesus says to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, Nicodemus, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, Nicodemus, as a Pharisee, he's looking for the kingdom of God. Indeed, he is. But the Pharisees, including Nicodemus, don't realize that with the coming of Jesus, it has come upon them. Nicodemus says, how can a man be born when he is old? How can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus says, truly, truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now this is going to take some time for Nicodemus to understand these words. But looking at his other appearances in the Gospel of John, it appears he does come to understand. To be baptized is when we're born again, born anew, born from above. It's the working of God through water and word that the Holy Spirit comes upon us in his grace. It's a gift from God. And that's probably the most important thing to understand about baptism. It's a gift so that no one can boast. Oh, what people do inadvertently kind of end up boasting about, I decided, I chose Jesus. But Jesus is the one who chooses us. He chose his disciples and he chooses us. Not that there's any great reason that we would be chosen. But out of his grace, he does choose us. Out of his mercy, he does love us and forgive us and call us his children. But Nicodemus has some trouble with this saying. The idea that the actions that save us come from the Lord above rather than what we do here and now. That is difficult for people to comprehend. It always seems like everything in the world depends on what you do, doesn't it? The grades that you get at school, well, that depends on do you study, do you work hard? You know, whether you progress in a job or a career, well, a lot of that depends on how much effort you put into that, and yet God comes in his mercy and gives salvation and forgiveness as a gift. Well, no wonder people would struggle with that. 
Nicodemus has trouble with it as well. How can these things be? He keeps thinking, like a good Pharisee that he was, that it depends on his own efforts, his own prayers, his own keeping of the law, his own decision to follow God. But Nicodemus, this famed teacher of Israel, was wrong. And yet Jesus still loves him and leads him to the truth. He turns Nicodemus to look not at himself, his own efforts, his keeping of the law. He turns him to look at Jesus, to the cross, so that the cross would be the focal point of all things. And we know the verse, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But see what precedes it. An event in the Old Testament that so strongly points forward to Jesus on the cross, where Moses lifts up the serpent in the wilderness, so also must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now here you see the connection with the Old Testament reading when the Israelites had rebelled against God. They had become impatient, as one could well understand, to be walking through the desert and camping month after month. They become impatient and angry with God and Moses. They say, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. So they're complaining even about the manna that God had provided. And the people then are misusing the name of the Lord God. They're not using it in prayer, praise, and thanksgiving. They're using it out of complaint. They're speaking ill of him instead of blessing, and the Lord's judgment falls upon them in a hard way. The people spoke against God, and the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. Now, you see, this is not the sort of squishy soft God that the modern world often makes of him. They want to imagine a God without any judgment, a God with no wrath, a God with no fury, and yet the Lord's wrath for sin is real. And we see how real it is that his own beloved son must suffer and die upon a cross for it. The Lord's wrath does not tolerate sin. And it's a terrifying thing when it's seen. Here, seen at the death of the Israelites being bitten by these venomous snakes. It's a terrifying thing if you know that you are a sinner who cannot help him or herself. The commandment, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, becomes their judgment. And the law of God is an absolute. Obey it perfectly. Today, tomorrow, oh, yesterday as well, all the time. And yet, as absolute as his law is, the Lord is also full of mercy. He gives to those rebellious Israelites a way to live, a way that foreshadowed Jesus on the cross, our way to live. So Moses made the bronze serpent an image of sin, right? Because Jesus becomes the image of sin on the cross. He takes our sin upon himself. So Moses set it on a pole, and if the serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. And there's a great gospel lesson for us. In our sins, where do we look to live? But to the cross, to Jesus, who bears our sin on the cross. So Jesus, when he's speaking with Nicodemus, reveals that the serpent on the pole was a foreshadowing of him being lifted up upon the cross, and that we who would look to him on the cross for our salvation would find forgiveness and healing and no longer judgment and death. 
And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. That's what he would say later in the 12th chapter of John. Jesus, again, talking about being lifted up. No longer like they lifted up a serpent on the pole in the wilderness, but now the one who is the source of all mercy will be lifted up. And he says, I will draw all people to myself. And then John says, he said this to show but by what kind of death he was going to die. Notice that Jesus is the one drawing all people to himself. Saving people is God's labor of love. That's his proper work. Yes, saving people rather than condemning is what God desires. But what will be of the person who turns his or her back on Jesus? What will become of one who chooses to perish instead of be saved? And what other alternative is there than Jesus? Who is there to look to than the Son? Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. But woe to the one who refuses the Son. Woe to the one who consistently and persistently refuses Jesus and his word and his saving work. Then there is only one alternative. They will perish, and they will perish eternally. Truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's what began the conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus. And you have been born anew. You have been born again by the grace of our Lord. And it's all good news for us because it means God has a heart of love for us because the death on the cross is an atonement for us, for our sin, all of it, so that the Father is no longer angry with us because of our sin. They have already been atoned for on the cross. This is why the cross is the central symbol of the Christian faith. Some of the earliest times, versions of the cross were scrawled onto pottery and the walls of early churches. There's even a very early drawing of a, a school or a child who would have been in school teasing a classmate who must have been Christian. And it's a fascinating thing. In the early years of the church, of course, much of the empire was still pagan. And the idea that one died on the cross for the sins of the world would seem like foolishness to some. Well, it did to one of these schoolboys. And he draw makes a drawing to tease his friend about his Christian faith. And the drawing is a simple, crude cross. And it has not a man on the cross, but a crude drawing of a donkey on the cross. And that says, I forget the boy's name, you know, David's God, right? And so it's, it's an unbeliever poking fun at the cross. And just as it would have happened back then, it still happens today that the world scorns our Lord. The world scorns the idea that God would come, become man, and actually die for the sins of the world. And yet, that's exactly what he did. For by grace you've been saved through faith. This is how Paul summarizes the result. By grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. So we are saved entirely by that grace. And we'll sing amazing grace at the end of this service. We're saved so that no one can boast. And we're saved for a purpose, an eternal purpose. Here already, that we might serve our neighbor and be a blessing to our communities and world, but much greater, you're saved for eternity. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Thanks be to the Lord Jesus, the Son of Man, the beloved Son, lifted up on a cross for us, 
that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. And we'll rise for the prayers of the church. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you gave and sent your only beloved Son to be our life and salvation, to be our Savior and our hope. Bless your church gathered here this day and throughout the world in the hearing of this gospel that we may rejoice in the salvation that you have given. Give to us steadfast hearts that trust in you above all things. Lord, in your mercy, bless our nation. Watch over and protect us from those who would bring harm and destruction. We pray for peace in our world. We pray for those suffering in Israel by the attacks of Hamas. We pray for those suffering in Ukraine by the attacks of Russia. O oh Lord, restore peace and order in these places that show your people there would be free to hear your word, to follow you, to serve you. Lord, in your mercy. And to you, O oh Lord, we turn for all hope and good things. To you we turn for healing, for comfort, for those in need. We pray for Betty, for Reese, for Pat and Phyllis, for Stan, for Jonathan and Lance. We pray for Janet, Esther, Laura and Barb, for Aaron, Doris, Tracy, Ray, Mark and Karen. We remember the needs of all these, your servants. We pray for Wayne and Ron, Jackie, Logan, Arvid, and Vance, for Dorothy, for Kurt, for Garth, for Sherry, for Carol and Reverend Patterson. We pray for Steve, Connie, Pat, and Loreen. And here we add names of those others, known also to be in need of your healing. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, we turn to you in times of sorrow and loss. And we pray now for your comfort for families that mourn the passing or loss of a loved one. We pray for the family and friends of Carol Smith, who passed away on Thursday. We pray your comfort and peace for Danny and Alex, who lost unborn twins to a miscarriage. O oh Lord, lift up this family and bless them in their losses. Give them the peace that only your word can give. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those serving in our armed forces. We pray for those who mourn the loss of those who were serving. We pray for our first responders in our community, our police, our sheriff's departments, our fire departments and EMTs, that you would bless them in the stressful labors that they carry out in protection of our communities. Lord, in your mercy. And finally, grant wisdom to those who serve in an elected office, that they would do so in accordance with your will for the good of our country and world. Lord, in your mercy. And Father, into your hands, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. May be seated as we receive an offering for the church of our Lord Jesus Christ.
We rise for the preface, page 208. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin giving him into death, that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. At your command, Abraham prepared to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice on the mountain. Yet in mercy, you provided a ram as a substitute. We give you thanks that on Calvary you spared not your only son, but sent him to offer his life as a ransom for many. As we eat and drink his body and blood, grant us, like Abraham our father, to trust in your promises, now fulfilled in Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, On the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you, for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always.
true body and blood, right? And preserve me with thy true faith and thou the life everlasting. Depart in peace. now in peace.
Let us rise. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in peace. And our children's bell choir will uh, dismiss to rehearse. Let us pray. 
O God the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. You may be seated for a couple of announcements before the hymn, and then after the hymn, we will have our children's bell choir doing a couple different uh, pieces for us as well. So we are in the midst of Lent, and that means that our uh, Wednesday services are really rolling along. Thank you again uh, to so many of you coming out, bringing the, the fabulous dinners. This week we have the Irish potluck, one not to be missed. And I saw one little girl, she's beautifully dressed in green, Michelle, perfect. She's already a week, a week in advance. We can't go wrong there. Okay. All right. So um, 6 o'clock for the dinner, the Irish potluck, 7 o'clock for the midweek service of Compline. Uh, our adults class resumes again next Saturday at 9 o'clock in the morning. So uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the, uh, this is the first time we've had our, our children's bell choir on this format before, and they've been really working hard on Saturday mornings. Uh, to get a couple of things ready for you. And they were, uh, originally they were going to do one piece. They were going to do uh, Glory Be to Jesus, a you know, nice Lenten hymn set to bells. And we're doing a special piece this morning in remembrance uh, and praying for a family that's mourning the loss of a set of twins uh, this past week. So we want to remember that family, um, Alex and Danny and their, uh, their children, Aiden and Ashton. Uh, these twins were lost at 12 weeks. And, you know, the world doesn't always acknowledge a loss like that. And so the, um, the kids are also going to do uh, I Am Jesus' Little Lamb in remembrance. And, and it's for them, yes, but it's for all of you ladies who have suffered a miscarriage and that kind of a loss. So anyway, our uh, children's bell choir will be coming out after we sing Amazing Grace, 744.
dog park. They'll be out soon, I'm sure. <laughs> All right. Yeah, they're playing the end of the service, the beginning of the second. All right. I see movement. All right. And again, these kids have been working on this for, I don't know, probably about six weeks, Erica, something like that. So it's a wonder to have them, and uh, I'm really appreciative of their playing for the service. Great. All right. And uh, Eric and Michelle, thank you for, for getting them together and working. Wonderful. Yeah. The Lord's blessing be to each one of you. Amen.